Buddy, we can determine was killed by a, an arrow. Can, can you bring Dr. Boylston the, the microphone so people can hear? Dr. Boylston will be talking about the Battle of Tutton on Friday afternoon, so she's pretty much the expert on the subject. And Cliff, I'll give you a chance to rebut. There were just a couple of arrow wounds um, on, on the skull. Were they, were they the ones that had healed, or were they the ones that caused the death? They were ones that had caused the death. Okay. So out of how many skeletons? Out of 28 skulls. Okay. So out of 28 skulls, we have two where arrows may have caused the death. And this is a battle that we know where arrows were flying into the Lancastrian troops at a, at a fairly high rate. Um, if we can find more conclusive evidence, I'm more than willing to accept it. Good. Did you want to? Well, as, as Kelly said, um, you know, when you get an arrow in the gut, it doesn't necessarily leave a mark on a skeleton. Uh, so I don't find that particularly indicative one way or the other. But the, the absence is not evidence. The it absence is, of evidence is not evidence. Exactly. So you, that, that doesn't really tell us one way or the other. Um, and what was the first thing that you were just talking about was, no, uh, let's see, it wasn't risky, it was, uh, <laughs> there was something else in there. But uh, I'm not sure what it Did you have anything else to add, then, Theodore? Um, well, could I just say something while I'm thinking yes. about the demonstration this morning? Yes. Um, you were talking about the cutting and thrusting, and uh, how thrusting was much more effective. But at Tartan, we had a lot <coughs> of um, cutting wounds. So um, I was just very interested in how relevant your demonstration was, and um, it was very interesting from that point of view. Um, so there was certainly cuts to the face and cuts to the, the skull. Yeah, that's important. Well, and that's what it shows with this too. Yeah. Not very pleasant. I think originally maybe there was a question back in the... Yes, you want to take the mic up there? Be sure to come back on Friday afternoon for Dr. Boylston's talk. It's pretty uh, ghastly if it's like her work. <laughs> she gets all the fun slides. The archers there look pretty exposed, so why not just charge them? They did charge them, and then the archers dispersed the cavalry charge. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what battle? <laughs> As you were, that is, let me see my slide, uh, they, uh, 20. It, if, we accept the, if we accept the numbers that, that, that purport to, to have a significantly larger force in French, at Adincourt, then I would I would agree that that probably probably charged everywhere. At Cressy, the numbers were pretty much the same, so they're probably charging everybody. But I, mean, I do find at uh, Cressy this very interesting that if, if what the Genoese crossbowmen or what's purported to be the Genoese crossbowmen account that suggests that, Her that um, Edward is potentially hiding his archers only to bring them on the on the battlefield out of the woods and um, out of the cornfield at the last moment, that that's more indicative of, of a fear of them being charged by, by the French. Cliff, did you want to talk about your slide? Uh, well, no, no, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes, Anthony. Uh, John Keyes book, uh, about the arches, about Not their arrows, they had stakes. They had stakes in the ground. And, and a few of the archer, of the horsemen in the charge made it up to the stakes, but almost all of them okay. were uh, shot down or turned back by the arrows before they got there. Or, or turned back by the mob. I mean, that's, that's as, as often in the original sources, they talk simply about the, the cra crashing together of all the, of all the individuals. In the, in no, the that, that's not the cavalry charge. That's the dismounted men arms coming after. But the, the uh, other thing, though, is, um, we don't know whether they put them in the ground or not. I mean, that's a, a nice myth, and a lot of people do stick them in the ground now. But there's, there's no depiction of that in any artistic work that I know. Yeah, but as you said. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's text. Plus, but, I mean, and there's no text. Yeah, it's in the guest of the Quinty. It's very cool. That they stick the, no, the stakes, but I'm talking about yeah. the arrows. The oh, no. no, no the yeah, stakes in the ground, definitely. 
put the arrows in the ground. And yet, you know, if you, if you go to um, Mark Stratton or any of the archers in England and you say, where were the arrows stuck? Oh, in the ground in front of them so they could pull them out quickly and fire 10 in the air at the same time. Well, that meant that they went, they had four and a half minutes of firing because they had one sheaf of arrow. There's a question here, and then I think one in the back. Yes, um, I do my own personal research at Agincourt. I uh, read a few accounts saying that actually the weather and the terrain affected the uh, fighting of the men in arms, especially the dismounted, you know, and even the knights. Is uh, that true? Or? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the thick mud was a tremendous problem for the French. However, it was one they could easily have overcome had they not been being shot by Lombard. You know, mud is, is a problem, but, <coughs> but the terrain is yeah. never as much of an obstacle as enemy fire. But well, wasn't it also the, uh, the close combat of the archers and the light and weight armor that they were wearing also a, a very integral part in the victory? We don't know what they were wearing. No, but well, they're, they're we, we have we have no armor from the Battle of Ashford or from that period. More we can suggest armor. I mean, that's inherent to the nature of being in arms. Well, anyway, we, we, I, we I don't have any. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes. I mean, I think that they, they, they certainly, by the end of the battle, they basically run out of arrows. Because, no, the longbow is not a magic weapon. I, I would never intend to suggest that every longbow arrow penetrates armor or takes out an enemy. Far from it. It's just that if one out of a hundred does, and you're firing enough arrows, it's extremely effective. Um, and so they have run out of, out of arrows by the end, mostly and did engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But I would suggest that, although the sources don't specifically say this, I think it's a logical deduction, that when the archers went into hand-to-hand -hand combat with the men-at-arms, the reason they were able to be successful is because most of those men-at-arms were wounded by arrows before uh, Because, of course, as I said, you know, the arrows can penetrate the armor. Most of, those, most of the arrows are not going to penetrate the armor. Some are. Of the ones that do, most are not going to be lethal. And those few are going to then be killed by um, archers. They could be killed by archers, or they could be killed by the men at arms, right? or, or both. I mean, they're going to be greatly disadvantaged in their fighting with the English men at arms, despite their superior numbers. All right, another question in the back, I think. And then I think we've got time for one or two more questions. We're running over a bit. Mr. Flash, how long can you leave the? Uh, I can leave it there as long as you want. Okay. Good. Excellent. Uh, I kind of figured with the fire alarm to just to go over and. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a generous of you. Okay. Back here. Um, uh, it was once described to me in one of my classes what the daily field rations were for a French soldier, that it was uh, some pounds of meat and a quart of wine. And has it been considered that after eating that heavy meal in full armor, then charging across a field under heavy archer fire, and then trying to muster up the energy to fight a more mobile opponent? Has that been considered a reason the Irish would be more successful in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Well, the sources are clear that, and again, Agincourt was a very muddy battlefield, and the sources are clear that the French, by the time they closed with the English, were exhausted, yes. and that that was one of the big reasons for the English success. I would suggest that one of the reasons they were exhausted is because during the entire period of their march, they would have been under a state of whole body muscle tension. Um, anybody who's done any, you know, martial arts, boxing, fencing, anything like that, knows that a very short period is really exhausting because your whole body is all uh, tensed up. And uh, when you're marching along and hearing boom, ah, every few seconds from your left and your right. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the tension is going to be high. Because that is uh, French for... Yeah. You know, yeah. Kabung, ah! is French for kabung, ah! <laughs> Except the kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. Oh, not effective. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think you've got, a, you've got an interesting point. We don't talk enough about logistics. In, in most instances, the battles um, were fought after rest and, and other things. But almost every battle ends quickly because the fatigue starts to set in. Battle of the Tay probably lasted, in my estimation, less than 15 minutes. Uh